everybody. I'm Helena Carbon, the president of Just World Educational, a feisty small nonprofit that works to build the informed public that's needed if we want to build a more just and sustainable world. Welcome to today's webinar, Eating and Living in Gaza, part of our continuing project, Beyond Survival, toward food sovereignty in Palestine and worldwide. Today, we are thrilled to be releasing three short videos that we have had made by our friends in the Gaza City-based production company, Ein Media, which allow three workers in key sectors of Gaza's food production system to introduce you to their lives, their hopes, and the challenges they face in their work. This webinar is presented jointly with the Museum of the Palestinian People, which is located not far from where I live in Washington, DC in the tr traditional lands of the Nakoch tanks and the Piscataways, whose lives and heritage we honor today. This project as a whole is being led by my longtime colleagues, Maggie Schmidt and Leila El Haddad, the authors of the groundbreaking Gaza Kitchen Cookbook. As the publisher of this volume, I apologize that it has been out of print for some months now but it is still available in ebook formats and the third print edition, which has some great new, new material, will be coming out next spring. Today's webinar will be hosted by fearless rights activist, Nora Barrows Friedman, who produces the podcast and other great content for Electronic Intifada and whom I am honored to count as a colleague on the board of Just World Ed. And in the conversation that follows the airing of the three short films, Leila and Maggie will be joined by Mohammed Abu Jayeb, a Palestinian American farmer and farming activist who also has a lot of rich wisdom to share. The video of the whole of today's webinar and the three short videos from Gaza that are at its core will all be available very soon at the online resource center we have started creating on our website which you can access via this short link, bit.ly slash beyond S resources. Nora will be introducing all the panelists properly in just a minute. But I want to remind you that my colleague, Amel Zaroub, will be using the webinar's chat box to share the panelists' full resumes and some useful background info as we go along. Also, links to a couple of recipes. So it's probably a good idea that you keep your chat box open. And please do use the chat box to submit any questions you want the panelists to address. So now, without further ado, I shall formally hand over to Noro Barrows Friedman to introduce and lead today's exciting program. Nora, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Helena. Um, I am really excited about today's webinar. Um, I've been friends with Layla for, I don't know how long, 15 years now, something. Um, and <laughs> have um, treasured you know, her work um, as a food justice activist, as someone who advocates for, um, for the rights of um, Palestinians you know, in Palestine and, and in the diaspora. Um, the yes. wonderful cookbook that Helena mentioned, uh, The Gaza Kitchen, which um, she and Maggie yeah. worked on for uh, so long it's and it has a life of its own now. Um, it really is like an institutional book at this moment. Um, I am just so pleased um, to you know, to see Leila and Maggie and um, and my new comrade and friend, Mohammed. Um, and I think today's webinar is gonna be absolutely spectacular. So um, Leila Haddad is a Palestinian American journalist, food justice advocate and public speaker. She's the author of a number of books and co-author of The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestinian Culinary Journey. Through her work as a writer, storyteller, and culinary documentarian, she provides much needed insight into the Palestinian experience. Born in Kuwait to Gaza Palestinian parents, Leila currently lives with her family in Maryland. Hi, Leila. Thanks so much for being Hi, here. Hi, Laura. It's so great to be with you virtually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we also have Maggie Schmidt. 
Um, Maggie, as I mentioned, is the co-author with Layla of The Gaza Kitchen. Um, and let's see if I have her formal bio up there. Um, there we go. Maggie is a writer, researcher, translator, educator, and social activist. Uh, she's the co-author of the award-winning documentary cookbook, The Gaza Kitchen, A, Palestin a Palestinian Culinary Journey. Um, and as Helena mentioned, an expanded third edition of The Gaza Kitchen will come out in uh, spring of 2021. Maggie works in various media, writing, video, participatory research, and recording the daily practices of ordinary people as a way to understand political and social realities in the Mediterranean region. Her recent work is centered on farm practices and agro food systems, and she lives with her family in rural Spain. Lucky Maggie. Um, <laughs> Maggie, thanks so much for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Awesome. And uh, finally, we have Mohammed Abujiab. Um, if I can get his bio up there. Let's see, here we go. Uh, he's a Palestinian American farmer and activist who grew up in Gaza's Mogazi refugee camp. And in 2015, he founded Om Suleiman's farm and CSA in Bilain in the occupied West Bank. Mohammed, it's so great to have you with us as well. It's good to be here. Looking forward for the conversation as well. Excellent. Um, so I think we're going to kind of jump right into um, our first uh, little film. It's about five and a half minutes. Um, it's about Intisar, who's a farmer in Gaza. Um, and it really, you know, when I watched it, 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 um, it brought up just kind of the, the overall, like, conglomeration of restrictions um, that Gaza faces, that farmers face um, under occupation, under siege, uh, continued loss of land, especially around the boundary areas um, and the economic restrictions on agricultural workers. Um, but how through all of these factors, um, how Gaza farmers um, remain tenacious and um, you know, and 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 very still committed to agricultural life uh, production and culture. So let's go to the video about Intisar. I'm Intisar Juma Aish in Najjar, a citizen from Jabalia city. I'm 52 years old and the mother of 11 children. This land is an inheritance from my father. I grew up helping him tend this land. He was a farmer and he taught me everything. A long time ago, I used to raise sheep, but I lost them during the war. I could not afford to replace them. Recently, kind people helped me acquire these sheep. They're still very young and I'm raising them. It will take at least two years before I can reap the benefits of raising them. I taught my husband and my children how to farm. We used to have farm hands, but now there are none. I can't afford them, as the profits of the farm are barely sufficient for our needs. There are some wells in the area, but not nearby. So I use a 110 diameter hose. The hourly cost of getting water is $15. However, the productivity of the land is declining, as I need four hours a day to water the crops, which costs $60. 
I water my crops one day a week, and this definitely affects the productivity of the land. And because I don't irrigate the land enough, the harvest is worse than it should be. If there were electricity, I could run the wheel. I need electricity as the sheep need lightning and I also need electricity because my farm is located in the border area. If I had electricity here, I would live here. I used to grow cantaloupe and watermelon. Its seeds costs are high, but the profits are excellent. But at the present time, there is a deterioration in purchasing power, as there is no exporting abroad. In addition to the herbicides that the Israeli army sprays on the border and surrounded lands, because of this, I had to change the types of crops I grow to cheaper ones. Unfortunately, the situation is bad because I don't own a will and the market demand has declined. When I harvest the fruits, I take the fruits on the horse and go to the market to sell them wholesale to some merchants. Ten years ago, we were taking cultivation courses. The Ministry of Agriculture gave us training on farming practices and the types of pesticides and fertilizers to use. I benefited greatly from them. After the 2008 war, the courses ended. Some organizations have given me financial aids to plant this land because I was unable to afford this. I hope to get a private water wheel that works well on electricity or solar energy so I can get rid of the increased costs and take more care of my land and plant more crops. All right, um, so that's the first video and, and I wanna apologize for the shaky quality. I'm not sure why um, that happened, um, but we will have the um, unshaky, <laughs> very smooth quality video up on the website after the webinar. Um, so let's see, the next one, we have is about Abdel Munim Ahmed. He's an organic farmer and co-founder of the Gaza Safe Agriculture Society. And this video, um, I think, segues nicely from the last one. It's 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 um, it documents the community response to these conditions, um, both uh, economically, obviously, and ecologically, um, because you know the 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 amount of land has shrunk. Um, because of, of the Israeli occupation um, and also the amount of um, you know, pollution that Israel has, um, has strewn about on Gaza farmland. Um, so this video kind of talks about the rise of community organized organic farming. Um, and I think it's, it's also fascinating. So let's, let's go to that and hopefully it won't be shaky. My name is Abdel Mu'in Mohamed Ahmed. I'm 61 years old. I'm an agricultural engineer. I'm married and I have five daughters and two sons. 
Gaza Safe Agriculture Society is a group of agronomists. There are primarily two of us who specialize in organic farming. We gathered a number of interested engineers and established the society. We aim to promote a sustainable and functional model that applies the principles of organic farming. Previously, we used to hold lectures, seminars, workshops and meetings with farmers in order to convince them to adopt this style of farming. The responses were very weak and everyone stated that the idea was very beautiful but difficult to implement. Despite this, we decided to start implementing the idea in a practical way until we could find a realistic and functional model that applied the principles of organic farming. We planted all kinds of vegetables in order to prove to farmers that all kinds of vegetables can be grown in a safe or organic way. We have grown all types of crops and vegetables. There was a center in the south in the Khan Yunis region that was called the Palestinian Center for Biodynamic Agriculture. It also carried out the same experiments and tried to do experiments to popularize the idea, but it remained limited. Traditional farming or chemical farming is a heavy loss despite the abundant profit that appears in the form of cash returns. But what's the loss? A rise in poor health in the community, the spread of new diseases, the destruction of human health, the destruction of the environment, and the loss of many elements of the biological diversity, such as birds and animals that existed which promote a balanced and integrated ecosystem. And any defect inflected on the ecosystem leads to significant deterioration in our quality of life. The vision of chemical agriculture is a short-term one, but in the long term it leads to soil degradation. It stresses the land, while the exact opposite, organic agriculture, works to build and improve the quality of the land and works to sustain it for a long time. Chemical agriculture depletes the land, and after a while, the land becomes unfit for agriculture. Having electricity at the farm greatly facilitates the irrigation process. The products are sold inside the farm, as there is a weighing scale at our office and everything we need. We are marketing the idea, not the product. When we started the project back in 2000, the purchasing power was greater. Now we are in 2020, and after 20 years, awareness has risen, but purchasing power is lower, which means that the issue has been reserved. The spread of COVID-19 has led to restrictions on movement, and thus a large number of customers will not come to the farm. However, we are ready to deliver the products to their homes, but crops that cannot be stored for long enough present a problem, and they must be sold quickly after harvesting, whereas we have no problems with crops that can be stored for a week or so. As for our foundation, Gaza Safe Agriculture Society, I constantly dream that we could have a private piece of land so that we can be more resilient and able to spread the idea more effectively. Hopefully, farmers will adopt this approach. Hopefully, farmers will adopt this approach of farming and won't be afraid to lose their crops or money. I hope that concerned entities that can support the farmers will do so, so that they are not alone. All right. So um, we do have a third video, but but we'll we'll show that a little later on down the line um, because I think it's important to have a discussion with our wonderful panelists about um, you know the kind of the the, the general um, conditions in Gaza right now for farmers uh, for agricultural workers um, for you know the the um, you know just how how people are being forced to change uh, due to their restricted conditions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what Gaza looks like now under these conditions and, you know, not just with 13 years of Israeli siege um, and continued loss of land, but now also with uh, the COVID-19 
pandemic and um, you know the economic and societal impact, um, not to mention you know the health sector, um, which is uh, you know deliberately unprepared to take on this kind of um, crisis. So um, let's let's go. Yeah, maybe Mohammed, if you want to talk first about um, you know what what Gaza is like right now and and kind of tease these um, these topics out a little bit for our audience. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Nora, so much. Um, so many things come to mind when watching these videos and so on, like uh, culturally, the annual seeds, the uh, land access and so on, but I'm hoping throughout this conversation we can touch um, on, on, on many of these things. Um, but just, I, I feel like some, some definitions and context are due in a way just in the beginning, just to make, uh, to make things a little bit clearer because I might, I might use the word falahin a lot in a conversation to refer to, uh, to ourselves in a way, the peasant class that, uh, that lives in Gaza um, and participates in agriculture sometimes and sometimes not actually most, most of the, uh, the folks that are in uh, Gaza that, are, uh, that come from traditional farming background. Uh, they actually don't farm because they live. Oh no! G camps. Uh, it's cutting out a little, a little bit. Um, if you could just let's see. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry about that. So it uh, the the word in Arabic is based uh, on uh, as as uh, some people might know Arabic is more of a verb based. Uh, language and the word falah is based on a verb. And actually that signifies uh, to, uh, to a good extent, the act of becoming, that is an annual act of work uh, that a farmer puts in into the land every year. And that is uh, basically part of the culture and so on. And, and even the meanings of the word actually relate to long-term success. A lot of connotations and meanings for us. So uh, I feel uh, framing the conversation through using these words uh, is essentially very important. Um, and yeah, I have mentioned the fact as well. I, I grew up in a refugee camp in, uh, in the middle area, uh, Maghazi refugee camp. And um, yeah, our folks have been uh, farmers and falahin for uh, thousands of years. and. Uh, unfortunately, they actually make the the biggest or the biggest chunk of folks that uh, that have that cultural heritage, not only as in um, something that they social and economically engage in, but as well the 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 extent, the cultural extent that is religious, that is uh, cultural in in so many ways. Um, so when I see in Tassar, I see other folks. As well, like when uh, in these videos, uh, Abdul Manam, it really touches as well on on the idea of land access, um, and and how much of the land for farmers is a periphery sort of land that um, that is it's the same actually in, in the West Bank in, in in many ways like in uh, Om Sliman Farm. The first thing that people notice once they step foot on it is this uh, humongous an ugly uh, settlement across uh, the wall uh, from it. So it, it feels like most of the lands across Palestine that a lot of the farmers are working on and so on are in a way or another are periphery lands that basically they have the first thing that we received within a couple of months of working on the farm in Belain was uh, a stop work order. So uh, it's as if it's deliberate that basically any sort of work uh, uh, would be uh, interrupted and be basically uh, uh, sort of put in that red zone that we don't want you here. And and I, I guess this is a sort of a natural reaction of a settler colonial idea because geography here is geography is paramount when it comes to uh, settler colonialism. So being on the land is one of the uh, foremost uh, acts of resistance. Uh, so, uh, but but I feel like that transition as well we're seeing in Tassar and uh, and how he she refers to a lot of the uh, the ideas and, and the learning um, that she does and 
uh, I, I mean, I, I, I find it apt that the video as well cuts to her spraying um, these, uh, you know, pesticides on and so on. And, and I feel it's very reminiscent, like, I feel like if we want to step back and actually see that process uh, for Palestinians uh, farming, it seems like there's a lot of free engineering of Palestinian culture that happened through agriculture in a way. And it's really reminiscent of the words of Chaim Margilio, um, whose name is carried by a settlement in the north that sits in the lands of Hanin village. Uh, and according to him, the solution to the Arab Falahim problem on the land was to take their land and teach their children. Um, so in a way, that's what happened. Basically, we, like a lot of Palestinians were displaced from their lands and put in refugee camps, like the one I grew up in. And these camps are spaces, pretty much a forced collective amnesia. Uh, we're no longer in direct contact with these lands uh, that provide the continuity for our social, religious, and economic practices. Um, and uh, basically, all these practices were based on tending the land. Once you don't have access to, the, tend to, to, to that land, you don't have access to that continuum of culture backwards. Uh, so instead, the children of the displaced generations and, uh, basically were allowed to work in what became Israel, largely, largely in agriculture and construction. So for that reason, the predominant agricultural practices that happened to be in Gaza Strip, and for that matter, in, in uh, other parts of Palestine, like the West Bank, uh, are based in settler colonial ideas of land as a utility and uh, agriculture as an extractive uh, relationship to that land. Uh, but what we're seeing today is that pushback that people, and you see it in uh, Abdelmenem, uh, in the work that he's, he's doing, um, and it's becoming more slowly like a mainstream way of thinking about agriculture in our society. Uh, and what you see, uh, it's basically, it takes different formats, including Om Sliman Farm that we started five years ago in Belain. Uh, we are reclaiming the way we are dealing with the land first by defining it in terms of uh, maybe technical terms, well-known production practices like organic agriculture, like in the video of Abdul Munem, but other formats like agroecology, permaculture, regenerative ag agriculture, etc. Uh, but the younger generation that I feel like is basically uh, leading a sort of a new wave is realizing that it is not just about the techniques uh, or the ecological model. It is about the social and economic as well. And this is why we arrange Um Siman Farm as a community support agriculture and others are starting producer or consumer co-ops motivated by their ability to support uh, deep social resistance. Um, so yeah, as you all know, like fighting back involves a fair amount of unlearning, um, that framework of learning that we, we, we picked up and, um, and farming has become with time as well a space for praxis, like farmers are now uh, not only picking up uh, the new, new ways that depart from that settler colonial framing and understanding of land, but realizing the inferior nature of, of that foreign understanding. Um, a society that seeks liberation through, um, through extractive agriculture uh, cannot really see it um, through, you know, and, uh, and it will not as well come through capitalist markets that want to see Palestinians basically ship their soil and water somewhere else. So I feel like this, this in, in, in short, what I, uh, my thoughts and reflections on this, um, from the, you know, the very direct uh, and probably from zooming out a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, Leila, I wanted to direct the same question to you. I know that you were in Gaza uh, not so long ago. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how, you know, community farmers are, um, you know, are, are uh, struggling through these conditions? Um, and what the agricultural landscape looks like right now. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was there exactly a year ago. <clears throat> it's hard to believe. Uh, and, you know, in some ways, very little has changed. In other ways, a lot has changed. Um, I talked a little bit about that in the last panel that we had, um, just in terms of the, you know, um, 
Hamad talked about the sort of re-engineering of the, of the culture, in this case, the people's um, <clears throat> collective memory of, you know, traditional dishes is, is completely, I noticed, you know, the, uh, drastically, the situation has just drastically changed what and how people are eating much more on a much more radical level than when, you know, Maggie and I were there um, 10 years ago. Um, but beyond that, it's just worth mentioning for viewers who are not familiar that, you know, the agricultural sector of, of Reza has been um, directly and deliberately targeted over and over again um, by Israel. And in the last series of um, invasions, half of the farmland um, was either destroyed or, or um, or uh, damaged, uh, um, and and um, it's worth mentioning that much of that farmland exists along that buffer zone that um, the first um, uh, film depicted, where the first farm was, in Tassar's farm, um, is located within that um, that buffer zone, um, so-called buffer zone, um, and you know farmers like herself often farm at uh, with a, a, you know a great risk and extreme peril. Um, uh, their farms are often cleared, you know, their trees are raised and they have to sort of replant them over and over again. Um, so it's definitely no easy task. I think that kind of got lost in the, um, in the film itself. Um, we, Maggie and I met several farmers that had um, had to, you know, relocate like once and twice and three times because their farms were destroyed. Um, so there's just so many levels, I think that, that, um, you know, if farming is a difficult enough pursuit anywhere, right, in the world. Um, but when you're talking about Gaza, I think I, I, the description for the panel talked about Gaza being hyper-stressed or something. I mean, there's just so many factors, um, you know, involved, whether you're dealing with the, you know, constant unpredictability, unpredictability of, you know, whether or not the borders will be open, whether or not, if you are a farmer who happens to export certain products like strawberries or something else, carnations, um, which, you know, in and of itself is a problematic pursuit because of how water intensive they are and so forth. There's always this uncertainty of will I be allowed to export these strawberries or not? Right now is actually like prime strawberry going, growing season in Gaza. Um, and then you're having to deal with if I'm not, then, you know, you've lost all your um, profits for that year and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, so it's, it's definitely no easy task. And um, on top of that, you're dealing with a situation where with the water um, and, you know, just to explain what she meant again, for, for viewers who are not familiar about the electricity situation is that in order to operate the wells, which are themselves, you know, few and far in between um, the situation in Gaza is a bit different than the West Bank and elsewhere. But um, if you're lucky to have access to a well in the north of Gaza, northern part of Gaza is where the water would be less saline, you know, and you would have good, that's where most of the farming um, land is. Um, but in the southern and the middle parts of Gaza, maybe Mohammed can correct me if I'm wrong, is the water tends to be much more saline. And there's more contamination um, from the, between the aquifer. Gaza exists along this coastal aquifer. And so even if you are digging a well, um, it's, you're probably going to end up having very salty water. But in order to operate that well in the first place, assuming you have one, you need a regular supply of electricity, which you are not going to get because you, you know, on and off Gaza has had since 2006 rotating power outages, um, you know, that when I was there, I think it was every eight hours, it varies. Sometimes it's every 12 hours, you're getting electricity. Um, and so you have to kind of time that, you know, with your being able to pump the water. And sometimes it's much longer than that. Um, so it's all, it's all very tricky. We're dealing with all these levels and layers. Um, and then just, you know, briefly, I think when people say like, what's the situation in Gaza, it's very easy to go to Gaza and be very, um, you know, taken over by developments you might see in the city or like new cafes that are popping up. And I always say, you really have to sort of scratch beneath the surface, read between the lines. And, you know, um, I think as Maggie and I put it at one point, um, you know, look inside the soup to be able to understand the um, nuances, you know, of what's going on exactly, because it's there's much more than meets the eye, you know, what, what you're seeing, basically, the whole place is surviving on, um, you know, on debt, everyone, you know, um, and, and, you know, and again, people's access is, has become so limited to 
fresh produce, fresh, you know, um, protein um, that they're essentially now when I was there last year, only consuming animal protein in by way of either uh, by chicken or meat, etc. Um, if you're lucky, and this applies to about 80% of the population once a week. Um, and when I say animal protein, I mean, maybe like a chicken or chicken wings or something like that, maybe a very small amount and fish once a month, if that, and several families I spoke to once every six months. And now you have, when I say fish, it's not even local fish. It's actually like imported, like Asian frozen fish, um, which is just a whole different level. It used to be farmed, for, fish would be the secondary. And then like local fish is really reserved for the, um, either the, the wealthier families or restaurants and so forth. So that's where the situation when I was there stands. Um, you know, I can go on and on, but I want to be able to give Maggie some time to comment as well. I know there were some questions about why Abdin Minan's farm on one hand seemed to have access to electricity, um, but on the other, and Tassadas didn't. And I think that's a really good question. Maybe Maggie can talk to that as well. And about the practicality of um, a model like Abdin Minan's I like what he said about I'm selling the idea, not not the product. I thought that was interesting, as well as his comment about the reversal from 20 years till now of, um, you know, um, um, I forget what he was talking about. He was talking about the reversal of like um, the, the having to sell the idea versus something like that. But I don't know, Maggie, if you had any comment on those few things. I know you have a comment. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to connect in with uh, what both Mohammed and, and Leila have, have commented. Um, for me, the video of Intisar is like a, a perfect illustration of the tragedy on, on so many different levels. Um, we see her there. I mean, the struggle to survive, as Leila said, like farming is a difficult enough enterprise to begin with. Uh, much less, you know, in a buffer area and subject to uncertainty, aggressions, herbicide spraying, all of that other stuff that's more sort of direct, the direct vulnerability of Gazan people and Gazan agriculture. But then there's the whole other part that's much more perverse that has to do with total dependence, both on inputs and outputs, and also a dependence in terms of knowledge. Like as, as Mohammed uh, pointed out, like we see her, they're spraying, and I think it's very relevant to look at her, her spraying pesticides, fungicides, herbicides on, uh, on her crops. The fact of depending upon, like these are techniques that she will have learned from the ministry and from a series of NGOs. They were training people in order to have them growing uh, uh, mostly ex uh, cash crops for export. Uh, so it's already, as Mohammed pointed out earlier, a rupture from a more sort of self-consumption model of, of the Falahin more, more traditionally. Um, uh, in order and a, and a dependence sort of, and this is not unique to Palestine in any way. I mean, this is the green revolution. This has been a, a worldwide turn in agriculture towards a kind of industrial and chemical based kind of farming. But as always in, and in everything, like it, Gaza is so tiny and it's, it's like you can see the whole tempest in, in this teacup because it is so small and because the consequences of these policies are so, uh, so very, very clear in such a tiny and, and sort of hothouse environment. Um, the results of this kind of chemical farming in Gaza means that people are totally dependent on all of these inputs that they require for this kind of farming in an environment where you can't rely on the borders to allow them in. So you're totally vulnerable and susceptible to the sort of ups and downs of, of border policies. And then in terms of the outputs that you're producing, as Leila already mentioned, with the case of the strawberries, this is also true of flower production, lots of other fruit productions. People have been trained over decades to produce these cash crop for export in an environment when you can't guarantee that there's any, I mean, that's cash crops for export are globally a problem for farming communities everywhere and, and for the model of farming people are doing, but that much more so in an environment where you're totally have no sovereignty or any decision-making capacity over, you know, whether those are going to ever be able to find a market. So it's tragic in terms of the, the kind of dependency it produces, both in terms of inputs and in terms of outputs. Um, and the alienation, I think Mohammed pointed this out from 
more traditional ways of farming because going back to what Leila was was pointing about uh, water dependency, you know, she's talking about needing electricity in order to pump water from a well. Gaza is radically over perforated. The fact that everyone is drawing, like there's no way to regulate because of the lack of political sovereignty of the authorities, uh, they can't regulate the drilling of wells. So gas is totally over perforated, which means if you draw out, I mean, aquifers work this way, if you draw out any fresh water that's in there, the, the seepage from the sea comes in and fills in with saline water that then will kill plants rather than nourish them. Israel is also overdrawing notoriously and historically from those same aquifers and is failing to provide Gaza with the water that has repeatedly been uh, promised. And so Gazans have really no option but to continue over perforating, but they themselves, and this came out again and again when Leila and I were interviewing farmers, they themselves are perfectly conscious of the fact that this is, um, as we say in Spanish, like bread for today, hunger for tomorrow. No, like there, you can, you can, you can draw these wells today, but you know that you're draining this aquifer that is the very fragile lifeline um, for for the whole strip. So it's, uh, and she requires all that water in part because, again, her form of agriculture has been focused on this kind of chemical based. Uh, what uh, Abdulmanim, I think, tragically calls traditional agriculture, you know, traditional since the 1970s. Um, but uh, but that over drilling, like there is a tradition of rain fed agriculture. There is a, tra mm -hmm. a tradition of collecting water runoff in pools and using it to like, there is a vast uh, body of existing peasant knowledge about how to manage these issues um, that, that this population and these farmers could be drawing on, but perforce via policies from various ministries, from various NGOs, they've learned this form of agriculture that makes them absolutely vulnerable to the uh, capricious will of the Israeli authorities, basically. And, uh, and so for me, it's sort of the summary of a tragedy of, of a people alienated from their own knowledge uh, that could make life sustainable for them and instead putting themselves in a situation that is totally vulnerable and and self-destructive in some basic way. I mean, uh, to, to be out there spraying these chemicals, Gaza receives all of these chemicals that have been prohibited in other places, but because uh, the borders, be, because what is available is what is available. I mean, and now I'm not sure what the situation is, but some years ago when the tunnel economy was in operation, people would buy cheap the pesticides that had been, uh, had been uh, prohibited in other places, basically in Europe, because they were considered so noxious, and they would be cheaply import. They would be brought in through the the tunnel system and sold in Gaza, and people found themselves with no option but to buy and use these absolutely toxic, uh, deadly chemicals. And and we can see the consequences of that, among many other things, in the rates of cancer and other illnesses in Gaza. So, so for me, Intisad is a summary of uh, a long and progressive tragedy. And then uh, Abdul Munim represents I wouldn't say the hope, but I would certainly say a hope, one of one of the facets of, of hope, um, but an interesting one, an interesting and contradictory one. And I think Mohammed will have a lot to say about that because he is drawing on, uh, he is drawing on, you know, working with rain fed agriculture, working with water collecting, working, uh, trying to create a community around farming. Um, but also many of his references, or at least the ones he cites are, biodynamic farming, permaculture, the organic movement, all of these coming. And, and you know, we met him back in 2010 and I know that his training was in permaculture at an Italian uh, uh, study center. Like it's interesting and a sort of continuation of the tragedy that this knowledge that he's drawing on to, to create a really hopeful model largely comes from outside and and not from this sort of long legacy of really local knowledge about how to make agriculture work on this land. So anyway, I think there's a lot of food yeah. for thought. You no, know, also, I'm, I'm just gonna say one thing and I'll hand it to you, Muhammad. Um, 
that knowledge, when you say the, the local knowledge, I mean, it was my observation, and you probably noticed in Tassad saying, you know, I taught my kids this, that a lot of that knowledge has been lost as a direct result. And, you know, I'm sure Mohammed can appreciate this of the years, um, you know, um, and the thousands of Palestinians that have, you know, lost access to their farmland and have, you know, um, either been raised in refugee camps or densely packed urban areas outside of the camps with little or limited access to farmland. I mean, we had met one woman, Um Sultan, we talk about in her book and which she was also featured on the Anthony on the Bourdain episode about Gaza. That was a very rare example of someone who had grown up in a refugee camp, but whose uncle, I believe, had um, in the 50s purchased a very inexpensive small plot of land on Gaza's eastern borders and then taught her how to farm as a child. And then she took that knowledge and had passed it on to her kids. And, but again, it, this was a very rare example, but it stands out in my mind because, because it's so rare. And because when we continuously talk about the traditional, it's worth mentioning that that often is just non-existent or people have lost access to it. And so yeah. the question then becomes going forward, how do you, you know, perpetuate that knowledge? Yeah. I, actually, this was my experience growing up in a refugee camp. We grew up uh, like amongst three villages uh, in Gaza Strip, Zawaide uh, and uh, Masadre. And my dad has a small farm in Zawaide, by the way. <laughs> so oh, I know so. very well, yeah. <laughs> so imagine, imagine a kid that sees his grandma basically growing uh, in, every, in every bit of dirt that we have, every patch of dirt that we could, that my grandma could grow in. That's how I actually picked first germs of uh, of doing uh, of basically growing arugula growing um uh these little crops that actually could do under the trees and so on but like as a, as a kid growing in refugee camp from all this tradition of Lahin, i was absolutely foreign to the places uh that were farming and the, basically where villagers lived because as well that like land access is a huge problem and i don't know if if a webinar would be enough to actually cover not only of course for us in uh, like um, perennial land access has been a problem for a long time for peasants in general and basically but for refugees and refugee camps where they actually were displaced uh, from a cultural tradition that was part of their lives for thousands of years to come uh, and be completely foreign to that. It's very, uh, um, it, 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 it's, it's problematic internally, but a lot of these internal interactions in society are usually glossed over when we're talking about, you know, the other end uh, of it. But it really, like, I feel like Maggie, and uh, when you folks like discuss the water access issue and so on, it's a, it's a really big problem, but like, <clears throat> all these traditions that we're picking up and basically um, using like permaculture and other things that we have, uh, they, they became more important in, in our community or the community, small community of farmers uh, in res like in response of like this, this series of uh, our agriculture is no longer good because Israelis come with this good uh, agriculture that produces a lot, but it's extractive agriculture, obviously. Um, and then we want to produce like these terms of production. Even Abdul Munam, you look at the video and he's growing cucumbers in, um, uh, in these greenhouses with water. Actually a very long tradition uh, and a very important crop that Gazans have grown for a very long time is cucumbers on rain fed water. Cucumbers and all cucurbits basically like watermelon and um, and melons that um, Intasad was talking about were cash crop that was grown on rainwater. The amazing cash crops are usually attacked, and I understand why, Maggie, because if you're a farmer that cannot grow your own food, if basically we saw, we all saw these news articles that talk about uh, not letting pasta go into Gaza, not letting cooking oil go into Gaza, and you can't grow all of these things, and then you grow strawberries to send out to the Netherlands, that sounds very problematic. And that becomes like the paradigm that is acceptable. But growing watermelons as a cash crop was part of our culture for a long time. And they actually grew it on rain fed, like basically was badly agriculture. Rain fed agriculture is usually an heirloom, the heirloom practice that we call badly uh, in reference to the bad God that was pre-Monotheism. Uh, that was the rain God in Palestine. Uh, 
so actually all the crops that I've seen in this video, the okra and the melons and the watermelons that um, Antisar was talking about, and the, um, what I've seen as cucumbers grown by Abdul Munam, they were all badly crops that we grew. And that was the predominant, uh, actually, um, some people are asking about even the, the makeup, the nutrition makeup of the food becomes extremely different, very different. The phytochemicals that are in the crops become extremely different. Like even the protein content of the wheat, the heirloom wheat that we use to plant using the rain fed uh, agriculture and valley agriculture was a lot higher, like that touches the 15 and 16 percent markers, while that was our source of protein. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's astonishing to me growing up, even in Gaza Strip in the 90s, we used to get anchovies and sardines basically at least three times a week. Um, and just seeing people not having, and that was a big part of uh, food. Uh, and the food culture in Gaza and just seeing all these generations not having access to these, we, we always basically had this um, integration between things that we grew and things that we foraged and we put that together uh, to make our diet and now these are extremely restricted and we're just struggling with these new uh, formats that um, of survival in a sense. Thank you. Um... And we do want to go <clears throat> to, excuse me, we do want to go to the next video, but I, I did, um, let's see. Yeah, let's go to that video. Um, so this video, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it connects to what, what you've been talking about, um, these, you know, uh, staple fundamental crops um, that are intrinsic uh, to Palestinian uh, food culture and, and nutrition. Um, this is a video about the tahina factory. Um, it shows the production of tahina and, you know, and which is made from sesame seeds uh, under occupation, siege, the economic blockade, and, and now the coronavirus. Um, and, and then I, I want to bring back the discussion after the, the video to talk about, um, talk more about the, the the lack of accessibility for these local crops. And you'll see how, you know, sesame now has to be imported into Gaza. Um, so let's go to that video and then we'll come back to, um, yeah, to more discussion. My name is Abdel Karim Salah Shakur. I'm 30 years old. I studied mechatronics engineering. I'm a mechatronics engineer here. Shakur Company was founded by my father's grandfather in 1936. The factory supports about 100 families. We import sesame from several countries. There are many countries that produce sesame seeds but we focus on the best quality that does not contain impurities so as to be distinguished by the quality of our products which has been maintained for years. The blockade greatly affected the import of sesame. The sudden closure of the crossings caused the price hike. The ban on imports of equipment and production materials has led to an increase in production costs. Sometimes, malfunctioning devices take months to repair, as there are no spare parts, because materials were blocked from entering the Gaza Strip. We buy water and use electricity generators, which leads to increased costs. The increased costs have further reduced the purchasing power. When manufacturing the tahina, the first step is to peel the sesame, wash it and separate it from the skin. Then we roast the sesame, sift and grind it. We've adopted a grinding method that gives us an advantage in maintaining quality. 
The equipment and machines we use are sourced from an external manufacturer and imported from outside, but it is difficult to import machinery. As I need to apply for an import permit, the permit's process lasts four months and I may be rejected or approved. Our first market is the local market, where tahina is sold through the company's main branches and we distribute it in shops and malls. The local market is our primary point of sale. There is demand for the export of our products, but unfortunately, there are many obstacles to making that happen. In addition to the cancelling of permissions required for export. We are distinguished by the production of red tahina, because we were the only ones who used to make it. The difference between red tahina and regular tahina is in the roasting process. Regular tahina is roasted by a steam roasting machine, while the red tahina is roasted by exposing it to fire directly. The demand for regular tahina is higher, but on some occasions the demand for red tahina increases. Currently, due to the blockade, the factory's profits can only cover production and operational costs, while the demand has fallen dramatically due to weak purchasing power. We hope that we can expand our branches and expand our production lines. However, the challenges we face are water shortages, electricity shortages and low purchasing power. The impact of coronavirus in 2020 has halted the production wheel at the factory for the first time and weakened purchasing power due to the curfew. Weak purchasing power has further affected product demand with the coronavirus. We have great hopes, most importantly, of having an industrial city with a reasonable cost of living we would like to see our products compete globally. We hope that we can export our products to other countries. I love that one. Um, Leila, can you talk a little bit about um, sesame and the uh, you know how it's a staple um in palestine and 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 what it means to have you know the these um, the, the production of of tahina so restricted um you know uh, yeah uh, your thoughts on that yeah i'm just taking in the sights and sound i mean it was absolutely amazing i feel like i could taste the <laughs> the tahina as it was roasting and at the same time like so tragic um i mean even i learned a few new things um i before i start i wanted to ask you muhammad do you know you know as as a farmer was sesame once grown was it ever grown in palestine like on a level where it was you know i mean i, I assume it was otherwise it wouldn't be but i guess my question is to tie it in like for viewers as well and at what point did it did sort of imports have to surpass the local? Um... Uh, yeah, it's it's excruciating to be honest to see sesame being uh, imported from somewhere else, um, and it, even the whole oil uh, economy or oil. Yeah, that, that I I'm familiar with, but I was like curious specifically about sesame. But I mean, you know, right. on both obviously. Then I'll go back to yours. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, sesame, I mean, goes back, if you think about, um, like, we call it tahine for a reason. We call it the feminine uh, name of tahin. Tahin is flower for us. And we call it tahine. It means it's actually at the same footing for us as tahin. Basically, the wheat and sesame were an ex extremely important crops. Actually, our folks call the only oil that I know that is named uh, yeah, we, we call it seedage uh, for sesame oil, but even olive oil, we call it zayt zaytun. Yeah. So uh, 
even, I mean, there are odes that women sing for the farmers of Sesame, like Ya Zari'in Simpson, Khallu Simpson Ajrasu, Illi Biehwo Ma Biochid, Kibbu Sakan Arasu, Ya Zari'in Simpson, Khallu Simpson Aimu, Illi Biehwo Ma Biochid, La Khallu Girdi Zimmu. But yeah, it basically, it's. I it's, it for the, for the viewers. That's great. Yeah, sorry, I didn't sing it. I should have just broke up. <laughs> pull I, on. I can bring my oud and we can start, you know, doing it live, little. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll break out and full on dabke on the. I, I think people <laughs> more entertained than just the conversation. Uh, but yeah, and um, and 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 this is kind of like an instruction manual saying like, hey, who th those that are planting sesame, keep it in its bells because this is how we thresh it and so on. We actually preserve it in bells and. Um, and then the, the, the threshing of it. But like, if you think of all the products and byproducts that come as part of the farming, because farming is just a continuum, like as part of a falah's life, you're planting something that actually works with the weather around you, as well as you're basically extending that process by producing the oil. The cake that comes out of the oil we call kusbe, and we right. feed the animals. Actually, there are kusbe sweets that you can- I was gonna say, my, my father used to tell me they would eat that. Um, Absolutely. And my grandma would send me to get it to actually mix with the feed for animals because yeah. it has a high content of protein and calcium. Um, even the hay. That because I'm not I don't know the answer to that question. Like at what point did did farmers stop planting sesame? Because I don't really see it planted really as yeah. much. Uh, I, I think it's a lot less common. The the whole paradigm of of having olive trees, planting olive trees, and using that as base for oil uh, has sort of replaced it. And honestly, I think there's so much, so much culturally that has changed because uh, annual seeds in general, grains and oil seeds, um, have been a social uh, resistance tool for the farmers, for fallahin, uh, or for peasants in general, annual seeds have given them the tool to fight against the lack of perennial access to land. Uh, while a lot of ecologists and other people, environmentalists and so on, like taught around the value of planting trees and so on for the longevity of like environmental change, I feel none of them actually have come from actual peasant classes where when you don't have that perennial access to land and actually most of the villages were uh, organized as commons and they they split the land between them as shares instead of actually before the Ottomans brought in the Tabo and the private ownership, the British that brought in and so on. So all these systems are new to us and pre like the, the if, if just rethink of Palestine of the village culture pre that annual seeds and annual oil seeds have actually given the farmer this social uh, tool that I can plant something I can and that actually I manifests that act and that reality of being of becoming every year right the land without the farmer or the falah on it is nothing it's just this empty land uh, so most of them actually couldn't plant uh, trees in that sense. Most of the trees uh, we foraged, uh, most of the herbs and so on we foraged, and a lot of the, our agriculture majority depended on annual seeds uh, because of these structures and systems that are basically, I think, predate Zionism in, in a sense. So sesame was absolutely, I think sesame and semne or sirij and semne, semne as well as ghee, as byproduct of animals um, were actually more used as fats in our uh, culture as a byproduct of agriculture because animals provided this amazing uh, um, basically resilience in the season that there, nothing was growing animals were storing fats and actually if you go to Jordan you'll see them as well making this mensa uh, with the ghee that is mixed with the herbs from the spring so you find that preservation of the vitamins and so on of the spring in the food and in the bodies of the liye is like that extra fat that is that a lot of that is stored in. So semne, semne and sirij were together our main fats, not olive oil. Right. And, you know, speaking to sesame itself, Nora, um, and then maybe I'll let Maggie comment a little bit more on the whole export part of it. 
Um, in terms of like this, the significance of, of Taina in the cuisine of Gaza, at least I can tell you, obviously it's consumed throughout the region, throughout Palestine as well. Um, but as the, um, as the gentleman um, referenced in the film, um, in Gaza, there's this very specific kind of tahina, the, the roasted kind, which was amazing to see how they roasted it. Cause you know, when Maggie and I saw it in 2011, um, it was a much smaller, like I guess local factory that we visited. Um, so we didn't quite see the roasting on that level. I, mean, I also noticed the factory wasn't fully automated, which was interesting and people were kind of manually um, which, which makes sense because every time I buy that tahina and I buy that specific brand when I go, I get the tahina, the red tahina with me. It always like opens because it's not like sealed, I'm like, um, which is kind of funny. But anyway, um, for me, the tragedy was what last year when I went that almost nobody was buying tahina. So this makes perfect sense what he was saying that there was just no market for it. I mean, it really almost made me cry. I mean, people were buying like a shekel's worth, you know, 25 cents worth of a little bag, just to be able to mix it in very specific dishes, just a quantity's worth, right? Nobody has it in their home anymore. I mean, so there's a lot of very famous, um, you know, Gazan dishes that Mohammed probably knows, so Magiya, you know, Romania, um, that, that feature specifically this red roasted tahina. Um, which is very similar in taste to kind of, you know, any kind of roasted nut butter would be the closest, you know. Um, but like nobody can can afford it anymore. It's, it's um, you know, and the fact that it's so dependent on, on this whole, you know, on everything, as he was saying, on the exports and, I mean, not the exports, but the imports and the, and then you have the same issue with the electricity. And then he mentioned the generators, again, for those viewers who aren't familiar in order to, you know, compensate for the lack of electricity, you need to buy these like, you know, $10,000, to operate a factory, um, generators um, that then need the diesel fuel, you know, and on and on, right? Um, and so, you know, I'm trying to, you know, of course, Tlaina itself, extremely nutritious. Somebody before had asked a question about um, how that has changed. Um, and, and I can tell you, and everyone can tell you, not just me, that the rates of iron deficiency anemia have skyrocketed. It was like 40%, and that's pretty consistent. When I went last year, has not changed in children specifically. I mean, stunted growth everywhere. You see kids in the streets that are, look like they're seven, but they're actually 14. Um, and, and this also, you know, the aid um, organizations play a large part in this and they acknowledge this is the sad part, right? Because what they're feeding them is, right, not seeded, not olive oil, but like soy oil, white flour, you know, white rice, sugar. Um, you know, if they're lucky, I think every few months, maybe some canned sardines, right? Not local. Um, and then recently, UNRWA introduced chickpeas. If I, might, if I might add, Leila, like when my dad came to the U.S., he had osteoporosis, and that's sort of unheard wow. of. Wow, in, in males, yeah, yeah. Wow. Unheard of if you're having like a crop like sesame that is basically a very important wow. source of calcium, uh, that actually speaks volumes to how the culture has changed like food-wise. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Thank you for, for interjecting that. Um, um, but what was I? Um, yeah. And so, I mean, it's just so when I hear people, I was speaking with someone on another panel last week, and we were having a very heated debate about <laughs> this issue of like, is it just, you know, him arguing that all it mattered was to feed people like if Gaza needs to be fed, all that matters was we just get the calories in and we just feed people. And I was arguing no. And for all these other reasons um, that we've seen, you know, in a very sort of micro amplified way in Gaza what happens over the course of just 10 years when you follow that strategy of we're just going to feed you crap basically what I've just calories you know I mean refined crap and then I mean really I can't really emphasize enough just how drastically things have changed just in the past decade um but anyway I don't know if you wanted to add anything Maggie I don't want to go on and on but I'm happy to <laughs> You're muted, I think, so. I guess, I guess there's, a, there's a whole universe of, of debate and discussion around the issue of the, the sort of calorie count to keep Gaza alive, the notion that, that you can, uh, there's, there's been an evolution over the last years in terms of how uh, the Israeli authorities determine the, the calories that 
are required in Gaza, and then the sort of constant hustle on the part of the different NGOs that provide food services to try to compensate the fact that um, that what what are understood to be staple foods, what are understood to be sort of sufficient to keep people alive in emergency circumstances. And it's notable that it's uh, considered emergency circumstances. So these 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 guidelines were conceived for dealing with you know earthquakes and storms, not for dealing with seventy year long uh, situations. But um, but yeah, there's been the sort of evolving notion of of the Gaza diet and what is required to keep people alive. Um, and I think again, this is this is the case in Gaza, and and because it's such a concentrated environment, we see it more clearly. But it's the case almost everywhere when we're talking about you know getting getting calories to keep people alive. But what kind of calories? Uh, supporting what kind of economy? You know the 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 wheat that's coming in through the World Food Program and and uh, Honor One and all the other food distributors what kind of agricultural economy is that sustaining and and reproducing um i think we have a, a huge can of worms here um and then and then the bottom line question of like okay even if you were to propose you know, trying to approach food sovereignty trying to approach uh, a more local production that actually is economically sustainable for the the population. You know the the absurdity of importing oil when you have someone that has a tahini factory that can't sell his product. Like trying to to close the circ close the circuits and and create a sort of a more um, a more or closed circle economy. How do you do that in a space that is as tiny as Gaza? As uh, as as dry as Gaza has become um, due to you know this long history of of mismanagement of the aquifers, um, one of the interesting things Leila and I came across in our in our research back in two thousand ten was precisely sort of this debate that raging in in Gaza about the Ministry of Agriculture had just released a. Under, under Hamas had just released a plan that would focus on approaching sustainability and based on rain-fed agriculture of what, what you could actually grow in Gaza. Um, and a whole other sector was saying, look, look, you know, you can't do that in a piece of land that's this tiny, like it's not, there are not those vast, uh, you know, extensions of land to grow wheat for a population that's this dense in a territory that, that's small, that has this little water. So for activists and people that are trying to, to help think through this, like, what's the strategy? Like clearly international, uh, large scale, uh, commercially grown wheat, you know, that's often being grown on lands recently deforested in, in Brazil or the, you know, overexploited plains of, of the United States. Clearly the answer is not to import that massively to malnourish Gazans. But what would be the good strategy? Like where, 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 where should we be aiming? Um, I should also say when, when he mentioned um, the import of factory components, just again, for those who are, know what the reference is saying that if a machine breaks down, it's very difficult to obtain a part for it because there continues to be, while a lot of other things have sort of quote unquote, um, been eased up in terms of, you know, um, what's allowed in or out. The one that has not changed is the ban on dual, so-called dual use items. So anything that is deemed to be, has the potential to be, you know, used for so-called illicit purposes will not be allowed in. So, that, but that includes things like planks that are larger than, you know, two inches or something, um, um, you know, parts for uh, components for factories, um, which has led, to, you know, to stalling of things like the sewage treatment plant, desalination plants, and in this case, the, you know, Taina factory and other factories. But some people actually forget that Gaza was a very, um, 
like it was a very thriving industry to produce parts for things that they could not import at a certain point. But as part, especially the second intifada, there was specific targeting of these shops that did like the iron work and so on, the blacksmith shops that actually provided these alternatives. I mean, I have friends from- hey, uh, My grandfather was a, had a blacksmithery in, in Gaza City. <laughs> so, you don't, you don't say. Haddad, yeah. You don't say your name is El Haddad for no yeah, reason. Right. I remember going to it as a kid, yeah. Huh. But, um, but it, it's important because Maggie posed an important question out there about like, where, where, where do you reach when, when where, where you, to, you go to for answering this question? I mean, I grew up. Um, the first time I had fresh milk was when I came to the U.S. or in a supermarket. I've all, I grew up on dry milk or I grew up in uh, eating the tahin, like the flour that the Anuro had that basically probably caused all the illnesses of uh, that my grandma had, for example, diabetes and so on. All her food was very bread dependent and so on. And they, 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 they ask themselves, like, what do we do if we're, we, we like to eat bread? It's actually, I feel like genetic that people, I don't know if Mediterranean folks can ever say, oh, we can, we don't want to eat bread or, um, but we get this like high carb, uh, starchy bread that can store forever. Uh, that basically has no, none of the fats and the vitamins and the proteins that we're requiring looking for. But I feel like looking for answering these questions, uh, it's the same dilemma like asking somebody in a refugee camp to pay the water bill and the electricity bill. You start from the wrong place and ask these people to fix this problem. Gaza Strip has this condensed population that was displaced. Uh, a lot of them, including my folks, have been displaced from the plains uh, that farmed for a millennia in uh, between Yaffa, Jerusalem, and Gaza. And they farmed, grew their food, and they were basically sustainable. Uh, people from Seba, like a lot of people as well from uh, Seba areas have basically been displaced, very Seba, sorry, been displaced to Gaza Strip. Uh, Gaza Strip became this condensed area of basically people uh, stacked on top of each other because of a political situation. You can't invent environmental uh, solutions for a political situation. You like the reversal of that political problem, actually the uh, like the return becomes an environmental answer as well as a political answer to the problem in, in, in Gaza Strip. People need to go back to places and actually get uh, back to, to the ways that they use to live in a more sustainable way to steward the lands. I mean, environmental problems, you can go on and on reading all the articles like, uh, I, I guess a couple of days ago, like the uh, one of the reporters in Haaretz was basically referring to how Carmel is basically building up this tinderbox again, and the um, anytime soon is going to have one again the biggest fire uh, like they had ten years ago. And the problem was, take this: we don't have enough people to go graze the ground in the forest. And if you turn around and go to Beit Seba, you find them basically displacing whole villages of Bedouins that actually, this is their job. Environmentally, Bedouins have basically taken care of the land by grazing and like pastoralists and graziers have taken care of our cover, our cover across entirety of Palestine and Jordan, these areas where basically animals can use these uh, what, what ends up being a tinderbox of like fuel for fires in forests and so on. So as well, occupation and the whole system in Israel creates this um, unsustainable system with time that actually environmentally the return becomes an answer. That's beautiful. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, we have uh, just about 10 minutes left and I wanted to uh, let's see. So there was, um, let's see, a question about, this is from Juan Campo. Um, I'll just read it. Our names are Juan and Magda Campo. We both te co-teach at the University of California, Santa Barbara, a yearly course on religion, food, and culture of the Middle East. We've been teaching from the Gaza Kitchen for five years. We're looking forward to the third edition. 
I think that the aggression of Israel on Gaza's agriculture is to make the Palestinians forget about their cultural food they ate for centuries and for Israel to appropriate the Palestinian food and deny them even to live on their land. Yes, uh, if you can please comment on this. Um, Leila, do you wanna? Can you say again the comment? Um, yeah, so uh, kind of, what about cultural appropriation through food? Um, it, while Israel is, you know, continuing to to deny Palestinians um, their was rights. Was that a comment? Yeah, that was the. Uh, yeah, if you could please comment on this. So there wasn't really a a question. It's just more like, what's the state of cultural appropriation while Israel continues to ethnically cleanse Palestinians, push them off their land, deny them resources, and pollute agricultural lands? Can you comment on chocolate hummus too, Leila? <laughs> every time someone says that, every few weeks it pops up, someone takes a picture of it and puts it on Facebook and says, look what I found in the supermarket. And um, someone at some point, I think my brother had said to me, and then, and then we just repeat this every time now someone puts that. I, I just say, every day we stray further from God's light. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone didn't get it and said to me, what does that have to do with chocolate hummus? And then someone said, I think she means it's like so bad it's a sin. I'm like, I'm like, why mess with something? Just it's sacrilegious, you know, just leave it alone. Call it chocolate dip. How on earth is that hummus? So it just, you know, um, don't get me started. You know, I'm a purist when it comes to a lot of these things. So I don't even like, you know, you know, kofta is kofta. Like don't make plant don't you know just call it something else anyway I digress but you know so again I've said this before you know I'm sure Maggie has a lot to say and Mohammed as well when it I mean when it comes to the I, I, I didn't hear the full comment but if it's specifically dealing with um, I mean absolutely of course in short one but um, you know with the issue of cultural appropriation I always just like to say it's all about um, context and intention because um, you know um, it definitely in the case of Palestine, it's wielded and used food and, and rebranding of food and, and appropriating of food is, is wielded as a, as a weapon and as a tool to both, you know, erase and uh, on one hand, that sort of the um, native indigenous Palestinian connection to the land and, the, and then at the same time reinforce and, and the, you know, settler colonial attachment to the land. And this is something documented from the you know, early days of um, um, uh, Jewish immigrants coming to uh, Palestine. And then you know, in the modern context, then you have arguments that sort of dissipate into, well, you know, does that mean we can't use the food or we can't, you know, which is why I emphasize it has to do with the context and intention. You know? um, and I've seen sort of a dangerous new trend even of a lot of um, you know, trolls and whatnot online trying to brand themselves as, well, we're also refugees from, you know, here, there, or the other. And we're also, you know, so we have as much um, claim to this food as whatever. And then trying to kind of use that ang angle to target Palestinian, either food activists or whatever, um, which I thought was interesting. I'm sure Mohammed, you've seen it too. This is pretty, pretty new. Um, so, so definitely, and I think people often, you know, fail to see, and I'm not talking on things as simple as just like hummus and falafel. I'm talking in a much sort of deeper, more nuanced, um, more nuanced um, level here. You know, when we're talking about targeting Palestinians who forage for things like, you know, Akub in the north of Palestine, like the thistle or Zatar, find them, penalize them for you know, um, that takes it to a whole new level. And then it extends obviously to, you know, to many other things, um, denying Palestinians access on one hand to their, to their own land, to the resources of the land, be it water or um, replacing them with, you know, other resources that are more, that are, you know, prohibitive in terms of expense, but also damaging to their crops. And on, on the other hand, you know, giving themselves access. I mean, this was well demonstrated when, when for example, settlers were still within Gaza and it still applies to the settlers who make up 0.01% of the, 
of the West Bank, but have 90% control over 90% of the water resources is a very good example and, and everything that that entails, the farmland and the whatever. It reminds me of a clip of like when Anthony Bourdain visited this one settler who had, I guess, come from New Jersey and been living in one of the settlements and was, you know, going on and on about how like amazing it was to live where he is and access to like these fresh pomegranates and and I don't know what, and he was feeding him all this food he made and how he's kind of like this amateur chef. And so Anthony Bourdain was kind of nodding. And then there's like a commentary where he says, and in my mind, I just didn't know, did he not like see the irony of the fact that he was on someone else's land and the most strategic location and all the best far fertile farmland when all these other Palestinians around him did not have access to those pomegranates and to these ingredients. And so not to say it's not a complicated answer, but it's just more nuanced than I, people sometimes say, hey, like that's our hummus. It's not, it's not really what it's about for me in a way. Um, but it becomes much more politically charged when you're in a situation and environment like Gaza of ongoing settler colonialism and occupation and, and ethnic cleansing, I would say, when it comes to, you know, Palestinians in Jerusalem and elsewhere, um, then yes, food is a big component of that. And definitely cultural appropriation, uh, you know, an appropriation of, of the foods and attachment to the foods does play a very significant uh, role. Maggie, Muhammad, I don't know. I'm sure I missed I missed a lot in my <laughs> ramble, but no. If, if I might, I might add, I, I think no. You said it perfectly well, actually. Uh, I think the the it, it comes down to the. As I agree, it's the intent, uh, like yeah. the genocidal intent in settler colonialism, especially in the formats that we see in the U.S. and in in Israel, uh, because it's uh, in its essence, it's trying to create this class of nativized settlers. Right, right. where basically settlers replace uh, the native population in uh, in culture, in presence, uh, geographically, in uh, economic terms, uh, the the actual and the core intent uh, that it, it's that's where it becomes extremely problematic because it's no longer uh, it's it's not I I actually love when other people cook. Palestinian food. But like when you see tahini is not accessible to people who actually have it as part of their uh, diet and an important part of it, uh, while you'll find it on the shelves of Trader Joe's, or it becomes this problematic uh, relationship because in its, in its essence, it's the replacing and genocidal intent that is, uh, that is at the core of it. So that becomes basically completely overlooking that we're completely trying to um, to sweep the native population under the rug and basically place this new and shiny uh, idea, you know, and it, it doesn't, it's not only, it doesn't come in food uh, only, like um, I, I honestly see it in, in, in environmental ideas, like basically the deforestation in Israel basically replaces all these uh, usually uh, alkaline, let's say, soils that we have with these acidic, uh, pinous, you know, evergreens that basically poison, in essence, as well, that basically environment uh, that to make it foreign to us, it becomes this form of aggression, right? So I can't turn on one side and sell the idea of having food or having nutrition or having uh, this um, really uh, healthy, wholesome thing that people could eat. But on the other side, I am poisoning and uh, replacing. And uh, so you can't, in, in our culture, you can't really base a good on bad. It has to be all the way rooted in, in what's good and wholesome to actually be all the way there. So it's, uh, I have to say as well, your book has been, um, really before my parents came and lived with us and cooked all the foods that I've been missing and so on, I've used the Gaza kitchen very extensively to actually, you know, uh, made me feel home in, in, in many ways. And you know, it makes me, it really, it really, really warms my heart when I hear we've heard this over and over again. And that wasn't like the main, you know, reason why we wrote it, but it was certainly one of the reasons. And, but I, I've been blown away over and over when people tell me that, like I, I've been searching for this for now, of course, in the day of like YouTube and whatever, things have become easier to access, but 
just a very small part of me feels like I can die in peace now because I feel like I contributed something to be able to bridge this very um, painful gap that I think we don't, it's not very visible. So people don't fully appreciate or recognize how painful it is that for Palestinians who are either unable to access their land, unable to visit or have lost that knowledge or don't never had it to start with, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy I was able to do that. It's just a small little, you know, I mean, I always say I'm a wannabe farmer. I think um, Maggie feels the same. I'm always learning. I have a small little plot in my backyard, but for me, it's one way that I can be able to learn and then pass that knowledge on to my my kids, you know. So the Gaza Garden book. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vivian always sends me seeds that I then try to, I even grew Palestinian wheat and we made Frika together one year, so. Oh, here you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, this is the uh, end of this fantastic panel. I, I am so honored to have been um, the moderator for this. And, um, you know, I wish we could have gotten to more Q and A's, but I, this is, I think the beginning of, of a long um, series of, of uh, conversations together. Um, so let's see, I wanted to announce a couple of things. Before you go, remember that this webinar has been recorded and will soon be posted along with the video of our November 28th webinar and many related resources at the Beyond Survival resource page on our website, which uh, the link is right there. Um, and let's see, today's webinar has been organized jointly by Just World Educational and the Museum of the Palestinian People and made freely available to the learning public. Um, I also wanted to thank Al Ain Media for these videos, which um, will also be posted on the website. Um, consider adding both organizations to your year-end giving list. And I'm also gonna make a plug for the Electronic Intifada. We're also um, funded by our readers 100%. So um, check us out as well. And your feedback is very important to us. As you leave the webinar, please take a couple of minutes to fill out the evaluation form you will be sent. And thank you so much for being with us today. Leila, Maggie, and Hamed, thank you. And thanks, Helena and Amel as well. Thanks, thank you, Nora, for moderating. Thank you, Hamed, Maggie, it was great to be with you guys. Thank we you. We should guys. continue this conversation. I think there's a, I think there, yeah. there are a few I more agree. turns to take, no? Yeah. I absolutely agree. <laughs> we need to use this as inspiration for another book, guys, together. Exactly. Yes. All right, all right. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, Helena and Emil, for uh, organizing. Thank you, Nora, for moderating. Leila and Maggie, it was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great rest of, your, rest of your weekend. Especially Emil, who's been present this whole time, but yeah. uh, invisible. Uh, big kudos to her for doing so much organizational work and and connection with the people in in Gaza and Al Ain, and uh, really she's the the silent hero of this story. <laughs> and thank you. All. Thanks, everyone.